Let's have a word of prayer. I'm going to preach a little bit today. Father, just thank you for your word that it's living and active. Thank you, Lord, that you've got a desire for the lost to come and know you. And I just pray through this message today, Father, that you'll help some people to get a passion for the lost. Help us to realize that we live in a different world, Lord. And it's, it's a world much like in the day of Athens that people just don't know who you are. So we've got a big responsibility, God, to share Jesus with, with the least, the last, and the lost. So today, move in our hearts. Give us a desire to share Jesus with somebody. Help us be willing to share Jesus with anyone that you bring our way. And may we see the kingdom grow through each and every member of this congregation that wants to share Jesus for your sake. We love you, Lord. So in Jesus' name we pray. Henry Martin was born um, on February the 18th, 1781. He was born in England. He was a very uh, intelligent young man. They saw that quickly in him. So they sent him to Trudeau Grammar School and then on to St. John's College. And finally, he received his uh, doctoral from Cambridge. He was such a smart young man that they continued to, to, to teach him. He also began to teach others um, soon after he graduated from college. In his heart, though, Henry wanted to be a missionary. He had, he had a real heart for the people in India. So he did something incredibly dramatic. He, he ended a relationship with a woman. He quit teaching in one of the most prestigious schools in the land. He sold everything that he owned, and he moved to India, to the mission field. He heard a message by Charles Simeon about the work that was going on in India. He was so compelled by that message that he was willing to give everything he had up to go and share Christ in this foreign land. He arrived there at the age of 25. That was encouraged by the other missionaries who were living in India to stay in the Calcutta area. Calcutta was where most of the mission was going on at, and the people in middle India, they had never even heard about the name of Jesus, and so he was encouraged not to go to that region. But yet there was a passion that was burning in Henry's life. It was a passion to go to these unreached, unreached people groups. So he left Calcutta and he went to Middle India to Kapuram, which is in the province of Pradesh, India. It's the place that I was at when I went to India in February. It was his first day in a new city. He went to the center of town and there was a Hindu processional going on that day. They took all of the gods out of this Hindu temple and they paraded these gods through the streets. And everybody would come and they would bow down and worship the images that had been made out of wood and gold and stone. The, the streets were filled with the display of gods. And there were many of them there. This is actually the temple that is still standing in Pradesh today. I saw this temple it was actually in this very location. The temple is made of pictures of all the different gods that they serve. And the water that you see out in front of this temple, to be able to go into the temple, you're required to go into the water and wash. Supposedly, there's a goddess that lives in this water. And when you go into the water, she takes all of your sins away and makes you worthy of being able to go into the temple. And if you haven't washed, you couldn't go into the temple. Now, um, I was there with my friends, and we were not allowed to go into the temple because we wouldn't wash. There's actually military standing around this temple making sure that you wash before you're allowed to go in. Henry Mark was there. He washed, as he said, hundreds, maybe thousands of gods were carried through the street. People bowed down to the images. They would lay flat on the ground and honor the images made of wood and of ivory and of gold. People would actually take their heads and bang their heads on the street until the blood would flow from their faces to show which god that they gave the most homage to. Henry Mark writes this. This event excited more horror in me than I can well express. I thought that if I had words, I would preach to the multitude that day, even if I lost my life doing it. One of the excursions I had when I was in India this last year took me to a place where they had a, a, a festival going on, much like Henry experienced. It reminded me of uh, 1 Kings chapter 18. Remember the story of uh, Elijah and the prophets of Baal? There's a story about how there was two uh, altars set up and they were calling upon God to come to ignite the altar to fire. And the people would dance around in a frenzy and they would scream out to God. And the Bible even says that they cut themselves to try to get the attention of Baal. I saw that. Same kind of thing that Henry saw that day. 
and there's something inside of me, something that just kind of burns inside of me. There's this horror, yet there's this sadness that grows up, that wells. Henry felt it. He felt it. I felt it. Have you ever felt it? Have you ever felt the horror of knowing that there are millions of people in this world that are worshiping gods that don't even exist? Religions that will never get anyone any place other than hell. How do we minister to people like that? How do we minister to people that have never heard on the name of Jesus? You see, here's the reality. The reality of this temple, the reality of all the people that came there to worship, from the time that Henry was there until the time that I was there back in February, there are people that go there that have never heard of Jesus Christ. That they do not know him and have not heard of him. People that their parents and their grandparents and their great-grandparents have, have beat their head on the cement until they bleed to honor the God that they serve. How do you minister to someone who has never heard of the God that we serve? How do you bring somebody to a relationship with Jesus when they don't know the name of Jesus? You see, often we will put people down and worship in another religion because we don't agree with that religion. But do we ever realize that some of those people don't know any better? And have never been given another opportunity. You see, that's, that's not the world of Henry's day in 1800s. That's, that's the world of today. This day and age, right in Logansport, Indiana, there are people in this community that have not heard of the name of Jesus. There are people in this community that are worshiping false gods that are no gods at all. There are people in this community that don't know what we know. What do we do with people who don't know what we know? And how do we share Christ with them? I think that brings us to the text we've been looking at for a number of weeks now. James chapter 1, verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. We need wisdom to know how to bring Christ to a lost generation. We're under the assumption in America today that this is still some sort of a Christian nation, and people still know the truth. That is just not true any longer. I minister to people on a weekly basis who they haven't went to church, their parents didn't go to church, their grandparents don't go to church. They've never been to Sunday school class, they've never been in vacation Bible school in their entire life, and they don't know who Jesus Christ is. I think there's an assumption in the minds of many Christians in America that this is still a Christian country and everybody really knows, but the reality is this, many people have never heard. Many people have never had the chance to know. Do you wonder why they're sending missionaries from foreign countries to America to share the good news of Jesus Christ? It's because the church in America is under the assumption that everybody already knows the name of Jesus. But that assumption, my friends, is wrong for many people who have never heard of him before. So I was in India. We were in India. I was doing some ministry there this last year. It was really interesting. We went to this one village, and somebody was asking that village, do you know Jesus? And the guy said, no, I think he lives one village over. I think you could go to many homes in Logan Sport, Indiana, and say, hey, do you know Jesus? And they said, you know, I don't think he lives in this community. He probably lives in that one over there. Because they wouldn't know any different. But the question is, then how do we minister to people like that? How do we as a church reach out to people who've never heard about Christ? You know, we look at Colossians chapter 2, verse 3. Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And I hope you realize that Jesus Christ had a passion for the lost. He came for those who were lost. I think he even says something like this. That he didn't come for the well because the well didn't need a doctor. He came for those who were sick. And how much sicker can you be than to bow your head to a fake idol and beat your head on the ground trying to show devotion? Jesus came for people like that. For people like that. And I think many of us even forget that he came for people like us because there was a day that you didn't know who Jesus was either, did you? And you came to know him. You came to love him. Paul finds himself in a place like that. 
Paul finds himself in a place where there are a whole bunch of people that have never heard of the name of Jesus, never called upon the name of Jesus, and he wanted to share Christ with them. Paul finds himself in Athens is where he's at. He's been in Berea. He spent some time in Berea, and he got in trouble there, and the Jewish uh, religious leaders didn't like him very well. They tried to kill him. He ended up fleeing for his life. A band of men went along with him. A couple of his companions, um, Silas and Timothy, they hung out in Berea, but Paul went off to Athens. Now, Paul gets to Athens, and he's hanging out there. He's walking around looking the streets over, and he realizes he needs Timothy, he needs Silas, so he sends his friends um, from Athens to head back to Berea to pick up Timothy and Silas and to bring them back to Athens. Now, the, well, the place we're at is his friends have left him alone in Athens. They're back getting his friends to bring them back to Athens, and he's all by himself. While he's all by himself, this is what we read. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and, Greek, and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happened to be there. Paul, is, he's, he's looking about doing ministry. He's thinking about it as he goes through the city. He, he sees these people, and he wants to do something with them. It begins with this idea that Paul was greatly distressed. During his time in Athens, he's walking through the city. He sees these gods that are lining the streets. He sees places that you can buy, gods of wood and gods of gold and gods of stone. And something inside of him just tells him that there's something wrong here that needs to change. Now, I just want you to know that there were so many gods in the city at that point in time that you could buy a god anywhere that you went. It was kind of like going to Disney World and getting mouse ears. They're everywhere. Okay, it was the same kind of idea when you would go to Athens. There were little gods everywhere. And wherever you would go, wherever you would look, you would find a place that you could buy gods. And when I was in India, it was kind of the same way. Every street corner, every vendor, you could buy ice cream and a god at the exact same place. Just, just was the reality of the world that they lived in, because they just don't know any different. And Paul recognized this fact, that he was greatly distressed. It says in the King James Version that his spirit was stirred within him. Begin to wonder what that means. What does it mean to have your spirit stirred within you? To be greatly distressed. The, the Greek word means to be provoked or upset at someone or something involving severe emotional concern. It can be translated provoked to anger, to be made angry, or to burn with anger. This is passionate. Can you get that? You want to write that in your Bible. That this greatly distressed is a passion. There was something inside of him that became passionately aware of how wrong everything was around him. So much so that it drove him to do something. Now, I, I think the church today understands greatly distressed. I, I think the church today gets what it's like to live in a world that we think should be a Christian world, that we were born and raised in that seemed like a Christian world that just doesn't seem as Christian as it used to be. Have you ever felt that stirring within you because, gosh, things are just not like they were 20 years ago. Things are just not like they were 30. Things are just not like they were when I was a kid growing up. You ever feel that way? You ever have that stirring inside of you, that kind of anger going on in you, but yet there's a sadness? I took my kids to go see that movie Home a while back. It had these little, the boob was the name of them, these little creatures. The creatures would change color with their emotions. Whatever their emotion was, they would turn a certain color for that emotion. Now, O was talking to Tip, who was his friend, and, and, and she had this weird emotion going on. He didn't know what color to turn. And he asked her what she was feeling, and she goes, I'm just sad mad. You know what sad mad is? You got, you got this sadness in you, but there's this anger that's kind of there at the same time, and O didn't, didn't know what color to turn. You know what to me? Because he didn't know what sad man was. When I, when I see Paul being greatly distressed, I see sad man. And I think the church feels sad. We are sad at the fact that there are so many other gods that people are serving. And we're mad at the fact that there are so many other gods that people are serving. We're sad at the fact that there are so many religions that are putting people down and, and, and messing people up and sending people to hell. And we're mad that the world even allow things like that to happen. You know what sad that is? You felt it in your faith. It's where Paul's at. He's sad mad. I think the church feels sad mad. What do we do with it? Look what Paul did with it. Verse 17. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, 
as well as in the marketplace day by day with those who happen to be there. He reasoned. Paul began to reason. I, I wonder what that word reasoned was all about. Um, what does it mean to, to reason? The word in Greek is dialogma. Dialogue. What, what English word do you suppose comes from dialogma? Dialogue. dialogue, right? Yeah, it's a pretty easy one, isn't it? To dialogue. That's, so Paul goes and he reasons, he dialogues with people. The word dialogue you translate this way. It means to mingle thought with thought, to converse, to discuss, to argue, to ponder together. If you ever ponder together with somebody, sit down and begin to discuss something, have a good conversation, maybe you didn't have the same viewpoint, whether the Colts were going to win or the Bears were going to win, and you kind of did a dialogue about it, you discussed it, just discuss the situation. That, that's what's going on here. Now, isn't it interesting that he goes from righteous indignation, upset, sad, mad, to reason. I think it's the transition that the church has a difficulty with sometimes. I think the church gets angry at the world around us, and we see all the false gods, we have all the concern, all the problems that are going on, and we are so mad that we want to beat people over the head with a two before. We, we don't really want to reason. We don't want really to have a good conversation. We just want to tell people, you're wrong and you're stupid. It's just easier to do that, isn't it? It's easier to tell somebody they're wrong and they're stupid than it is to reason. But, but Paul didn't go to telling people they were stupid. Paul went to reason. So he reasoned, now catch this, in the synagogue, is where he begins, both Jews and God fearing Greeks. The synagogue kind of, is a great name for a Jewish church. These are Jewish people that knew the Jewish God, the God that we serve, that isn't God, Jesus Christ yet. So he began there. He, he reasoned with God fearing Greeks. Uh, God-fearing Greeks are people that were, that were not Jewish, not born into the Jewish family, but accepted the God of the Jews. So when he talked to them, what did he reason about? The Bible's pretty clear. It says he was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. That's what he was talking about, the good news. He just wanted to share, you know what the good news is? Let me tell you a little bit of bad news before I try to get this. The bad news is that everybody's sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The bad news is the wages of sin is death. That's the bad news. And that bad news applies to everybody. The good news is that while you were still a sinner, Jesus Christ died for you. That's good news, isn't it? The, the good news is, is that Jesus Christ took your place on the cross. The good news is we took communion today. We received those elements of communion reminding us that Jesus died for us. That's the good news. And he didn't just talk about the good news. He goes on to say he talked about the resurrection. You know why the resurrection is so important? Because every other world religion has a gravestone committing the place where that religion began. Every other one except for Christianity. You see, every other religion has a gravestone where their founder still lays today. We have an empty cross and an empty tomb to signify who we worship. Amen? That's good news today, my friend. That's what he talked about. You want to know what he reasoned about? He reasoned with people about the good news in the resurrection. Who, who, let me back up. Who did he reason with, though? Day by day with those who happened to be there. Who happened to be there. Let me say it this way. He didn't care who showed up in church. He would minister to any of them. It didn't matter if you were black and white. It didn't matter if you were Republican or Democrat. It didn't matter if you were rich or you were poor. He didn't care. If you showed up, he was going to share the good news with you. Do we have that same viewpoint today? Do we feel that way? Are we just trying to bring middle, upper class people to know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior? Or are we going to minister to anybody that comes our way? Anyone who happens to be here. Anybody that shows up on a Sunday morning. We're going to tell them about Jesus. Any person that you walk into during the middle of the week, whether you're at Walmart or Kmart or wherever, you're going to share Christ with them because God has crossed your path with them. Are you ready to be that kind of an evangelist for Jesus? So Paul was so sad and mad that he had to share Christ. Saul was so, 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 so upset about his, his situation that he had to do something about it. Church, can I tell you, we've got to quit beating people over heads with two before us. And we've got to start loving people into the kingdom. Anybody and everybody that God brings our way. Anybody who happened to be there, Paul would preach the good news of Jesus Christ. He would share about the resurrection. Now catch verse 17. Or verse 19, excuse me. Then they took Paul and brought him to the meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, May we know that this new, may we know what this new teaching that you are presenting. 
you are bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. All of the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking and listening about the latest ideas. Paul, Paul said he's doing what he normally does. He's going to share the good news of Jesus with anybody and everybody that comes his way. He's talking to them about it. People begin to want to know. They want to know more. There's a group of people that, that reside in Athens that are very influential people. They're the Epicureans and the Stoic philosophers of the day. And they would go up onto a hill, and they would sit around and they would pass around ideas. So much so that Paul writes this. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. It's like the internet of Athens. This is what they just sit around all day long thinking and listening and talking and sharing information. And, and while you're doing this, you've got to figure out who's right and who's wrong. So let's just check it all out and talk about it. And they spent, according to Scripture, all of their time doing nothing but thinking. Listen, arguing, debating. Now let me tell you a little bit about the two schools that are studying on this hill before we get to the hill. The Epicureans. The Epicurean philosophers, they were people that valued pleasure above all else. Okay? If you want to write anything down in your notes today, make sure you catch this. These are the two groups that Paul's going to minister to. The Epicureans, people that valued pleasure above all else. They didn't believe in Greek mythology. They were deists. They believed that there was a God someplace in the universe that started all of this, but God had kind of walked away from his creation. They were indifferent about the human equation. Very educated. They were the Socrates, the Plato, the Aristotle of that day. Then there were the Stoics. Okay, The Stoics, they valued harmony and reason. They believed in the supreme God and lesser gods. They were pantheists. The Stoics believed in fate. They were all about self-sufficiency, but they also believed you needed to help your fellow man. You needed to do something good for somebody else. You needed to take care of those that were around you. And they would argue. They would argue all day their different philosophies. It's kind of like Republicans and Democrats on the Hill. It's kind of what it's like. You know, they're just sitting there arguing their point all day long and not really accomplishing a whole lot of anything. Now, let me show you. should have said that. <laughs> These are the steps that lead to the hill where they're going to take Paul. This is actually the hill where the philosophers would all set. And as you're sitting on this hill, you can see in a distance another hill. It's a pretty famous hill. It's the hill where the Pantheon is located at. There's also a temple to Aphrodite there. The little temple that's in front of it is the temple Nike. No, it's not about shoes. But it is called the god of god, the god is called Nike, and that's where he would reside. And, they would worship that. And over the distance, you can see where Paul would have been standing as he shared his thoughts uh, with the people on Mars Hill that day. Down at the bottom is a, a, an amphitheater. Um, it seats 25,000 people. All of that was standing in 450 B.C. So when Paul goes to Athens, all of this is right there in his line of sight. And this is where they would go to worship their gods. So Paul goes to the top of Mars Hill, and he starts to share with them. Then Paul stood up at the meeting of the Areopagus Mars Hill and said, People of Athens, I see that just in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar there with this inscription to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship, and that is why I am going, what, what, what I am going to proclaim. <laughs> Isn't it interesting how he begins? I see that you are very what? He, he didn't say, I see that you're very stupid. <laughs> okay. He didn't say, I see that you don't have a clue what you're talking about. I see how ignorant you are of the situation you find yourself in. He doesn't begin there, does he? How does he begin? He compliments them. Now you and I both know today that religion will not get you into heaven, right? Do you know that today? It's a relationship with Jesus Christ that gets you into heaven. Religion is the thing that, that comes out of our relationship. And so he looks at these people, and he says, I just want you to know today, I think you're very religious. You are very religious. And I can just see the, the philosophers, mm, yes, we are. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad you noticed that about us. Because <laughs> they were very religious. And then the next thing, is, he says, he walked around and he looked carefully at your objects of worship, and I found an altar there. And who was the altar to? And then God. And, and, and Paul does something that just so brings. Let me tell you about the God 
that you don't know. Christians, we, we haven't figured this out in America. I was supposed to preach it was four weeks ago now. I'm halfway through second service in the message, and the Lord just spoke into my thoughts like I hadn't heard in a long time. And he said, Christians in America have no idea how to minister in a non-Christian world. Christians in America have no idea how to minister in a non-Christian world. And the reality is we are living in a non-Christian world. And we've got to figure out how to minister to them. I read an article a few weeks ago that said that churches of under 200 people, over half of them will be dead in the next 20 years. Over half of them. Less than 200 people in church, half of those churches. In the next 20 years, we're just going to write them off the face of the earth. And I wondered why. And maybe it's because churches like that are just not going to bring people to the kingdom of God. Isn't that where our job is? You took communion today, right? I mean, you, you received the elements of the Lord's Supper because Jesus Christ means so much to you that you wanted to receive that into yourself. Now the question is, will you take the energy from what you receive out into a world that needs to do what we did today? But too often we don't want to do that. Too often we want to receive it to ourselves, accept it to ourselves, and just live under the blessing of communion when there's a world that needs communion. The question is, will we share it with them? Do we have a passion for the lost that will bring them into a place where they can know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? Paul does something just totally out there. He ministers to people who don't know who Christ is, and he, he never really tells them that they're fools. He loves them in the kingdom. Can we do that? Will we do that? For this, requires wisdom. I was, I was in jail here a while back doing some ministry. Um, it was a Sunday afternoon and I was preaching and I got to preaching and there's this young kid that's there. He's, I just want you to know, Aaron, I don't believe anything that you just said about God. So I don't believe in God. I don't believe there's a God. I believe in science. Science answers all questions. Science is the way that this whole world came into being and I just want you to know, I, I don't agree with you. I, I believe in science. I said, I'm glad you believe in science. I believe in science too. I, I, I believe science tells us anything and everything we need to know about this world and how it was created, how it's formed, and how it exists. And you look at me, really? You believe that? So yeah, so science is an amazing thing. So here's the difference between you and me. I believe there's a great scientist in the heavens that put all of this stuff together. And he scientifically knew how to do it. So he, he, he took science. He, he took physics. He took the laws of motion. He incorporated all of those things together. And we have spent the last couple hundred years now trying to figure out what he created. That guy looked at me and said, I go to a church like that. <laughs> I go to a church like that. I, I, I confess today, I have beat a lot of religions over the head. Probably to the point that some people would never listen to the message of Jesus Christ that I have to share because of what I've said. And I recognize the fact today that there are people that are third, fourth, fifth, sixth generation Buddhist, third, fourth, fifth, sixth generation Hindu, third, fourth, fifth generation Hare Krishna. And they just don't know any better. And until I'm willing to be a little more like Paul and stand in the presence of a place where people don't know any different and share the truth about Jesus, they will never know the difference. <laughs> Are we willing to be a little bit different in the church? Are we willing to be a little bit more like Paul was in Athens, or, or not? But can I say in this day and age, we better learn to minister a little bit more like Paul did because those are the people we're ministering to. That's the world we live in. That is our reality now. We live in a world where there's lots of so-called gods. Are you ready to minister in that world? Father, I pray that we will be a church that's ready and willing to minister in that world. Lord, you know, you know my heart. I believe that there's one true living God in heaven. And I believe his one and only son, Jesus Christ, came to serve and die for us. None of that has changed in me, Lord. 
But I do believe with every bit of my being we are not a Christian country any longer. And I believe we need to know how to minister to people who have never heard their name. And so, Father, I pray for this congregation today that we will learn how to be a little more like Paul and minister in a world that just doesn't know who you are. I pray that we're willing to, to step out in faith and, and believe that you are a God who will change us and give us the ability to minister to people that, that don't know who you are. Father, I pray that you help us to find common ground with people and love people into the kingdom and not bash them and keep them in the kingdom. God, God give us eloquence in our speech and give us a love for people that are lost until it forces us to do something different for your kingdom. I pray that every ounce of energy we receive from the bread and the cup today will be used to bring people into your kingdom. May the spiritual energy we receive, may the nourishment that came into our bodies all be used, Father, for your kingdom's glory to make a difference right here in this kingdom. God, use this church to reach the lost. Use this church to reach the lost. Help us to be the warmest incubator in our community that brings baby chicks into the kingdom and shares the love of Jesus with them in a way that they never experienced. <coughs> Help us, Father, to know that love. Help us to live that love. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's dance with some closest Thank you.